Hello, so today we're going to be talking about narration styles, how a narrator's point of view is going to shape the themes that you see in a passage. And um, for this activity, if you haven't seen the module, the first thing I had you do was make sure that you have this narration style terms um, worksheet somewhere in your notes, like maybe you have it in binders because we did this uh, a long time ago, I think when we were talking about Frankenstein. Um, but this is going to give you a lot of different narration terms that you can use when you're writing your essay. And for this lecture, I want to look at a passage that is in the first person and a passage that is in the third person and talk about this idea of bias that we see emerging with narration. So these are both passages that you've seen before. The first one we're going to look at is the Blythdale Romance passage. This was the one um, from Nathaniel Hawthorne. You wrote thesis statements about it. It's the guy is um, talking to a character named Zenobia. What a great name. Um, and so you've read this already, but if you haven't gotten a chance to review it, it'll be helpful to see it in more detail. So pause the video, open up this document, and read through it really quick. Um, okay, so this one is in the first person. We know that from the very first sentence, her manner bewildered me. We also found, find out in the very first sentence that he has some kind of bias when looking at Zenobia. But what I want to be careful of is that term bias, because first person narration is always biased. Um, we always have a specific point of view when we are looking at the world and describing the events. And so it's not super helpful in your essays to write about this idea of bias and instead think about how first person narration is always character development. Every single sentence that this person writes, even the dialogue of the other person is character development because all of this is coming filtered through a kind of a perspective of the world and the way that this person experiences the world. So, um, you know, the way that he senses it, his ideas that he has, the relationships he has with other people, all of those are filtering this story so that we are getting a, a story that the entire thing is in service of character development, if that makes sense. So try not to talk so much about bias and instead talk about how narration is building character. And in this one, we get that right away too. Her manner bewildered me. So right away with that word bewildered, we know that this person has a limited perspective. He is coming at this scene with a kind of confusion. And then we add to that confusion in the second sentence. It says, literally, moreover, I was dazzled by the brilliancy of the room. So he's both bewildered and dazzled. We get a sense of confusion here and a way that um, when you think about the word dazzled, it's like it's usually a kind of superficial word. Like when you are dazzled, it means that you um, are kind of blind to maybe the more substantial ideas and instead you're kind of like looking at all the flashing lights and kind of um, taken up in them, right? So we know that he's coming from this position of impairment. His perspective is impaired by both his confusion and his dazzlement. And the whole first paragraph continues to develop that idea. If you look a little bit further, it says, it struck me that here was the fulfillment of every fantasy of an imagination. So that idea struck is really interesting here. When you are struck by an idea, it's like you're kind of helpless to that idea. It bulldozes you so that you become a kind of prisoner of that idea. And that's sort of what he is talking about here. In this whole passage, he's kind of talking about the limits of his own perspective and how he is split. He is dazzled by his surroundings, he thinks that everything is absolutely beautiful and stunning, including this character of Zenobia. But he is also, instead of just causing this a kind of pleasure for him, it causes a bewilderment for him because he clearly has some ideas of judgment about that kind of um, superficiality, right? And we see that when he talks about the costly self-indulgence. Where is that section? 
There it is. It's a little bit earlier here. Okay. It struck me that here was the fulfillment of every fantasy of, of an imagination, reveling in various methods of costly self-indulgence and splendid ease. That little section right there is so full of contradictions and juxtapositions, right? It's, it's struck. So that's not a super positive word to be struck by something, but it's struck by a fantasy, which usually has a positive connotation. Reveling is a, usually has a kind of positive connotation. You're like enjoying it so much that you're reveling in it. Um, but then it's costly self-indulgence, which has a very negative selfish connotation to it. And then splendid ease, which again has that positive connotation. So what we see here is that he's dazzled by the surroundings. He thinks that um, they're luxurious, they're passionate, I'm going, I'm using words from this, they are exceedingly rich. And the, it seems like the philosophical part of his mind is like, that self-indulgence, that's not the life I want to live. If you go back to the prompt, it says, um, communal rural living is what Blythdale Farm is all about. And this kind of self-indulgence is the opposite of communal rural, that's such a hard way, word to say, communal rural living. Um, it's the opposite of that, right? And yet he recognizes at the same time the kind of uh, seduction of that kind of luxurious life. So he is both enjoying the luxuriousness and trying to remain critical. And this maybe is what where he gets this idea of bewilderment. Like he's mostly, he's in conflict right now. And Part of what causes the conflict is also that he is seeing things in a mirror image. You look and it says, um, and the whole repeated and doubled by the reflection of a great mirror, which showed me Zenobia's proud figure likewise and my own. Um, anytime you see a mirror in literature, there's a good chance there's something symbolic going on there. And as you read the rest of the passage, you start to uh, read about how he's questioning which one is the true Zenobia. So you think about a mirror image and you're like, which one is the true me? Is it me standing here that I feel? Or is it the me reflected in the mirror? It creates this, uh, uh, the, the passage creates this kind of tableau image. A tableau is like um, is like a uh, group of figures that represent a scene. Usually those were scenes in history, but since then we have used the term tableau a little bit more loosely and said that this is just a, a kind of still image, a kind of living picture. And so they're standing in this mirror and he's looking at the living picture and he is wondering which one is the true Zenobia? Is it the one that I knew in this rural community living? Or is it the one who is here in this fancy schmancy house? Um, and so as he, we're not going to go through the rest of the passage in so much detail, but as he is sort of like thinking about this conflict in his head and thinking about the, um, the seduction and the temptation that exists in this house. And I mean like the seduction of like physical objects. Like imagine you're living in a dirty farm surrounded by people and you go to this nice mansion and you're like, ooh, I know that it's right to live on the communal farm. I know that's my, my way of living that I've chosen, but this seems super nice. They've got a bathroom here. They've got running water. Uh, you can have your own private space. He's kind of experiencing that conflict. And as he goes back and forth in this dialogue, he's trying to assert his ideas in the face of his sensations. So you can get all of that from the way that his narration style, his first person narration is creating tone and creating the conflict. So you look here at our terms and it says first person. Okay. We all know that, you know, narration that uses I and me and et cetera. And then you have to decide is he is an observer or a participant. And in this one, though he is observing his surroundings, he is clearly a participant in the story because he's having this full conversation with Zenobia. Okay. So first person narration, it seems kind of obvious that it is filtered through a perspective. So in the next video, let's think about how third person narration also provides judgments much of the time. Okay.